did well. Yeah. This is it, formal police department. Okay. Did you just speak with somebody at the residence? Uh, yes. I just spoke with, I guess, the daughter's boyfriend. Alright, so, um, I'm making this video because, or if anybody finds this, um, I really don't know what I'm trying to say, and just, I'm breathtaking at what I've done, and I apologize. I know I'm gonna pay for my consequences, you know, I wish that I could've not done this, but I just lost my mind. To anybody that finds this, tell my parents that, like, I love them, and I'm very sorry for doing this, and, uh... How did you do it? Jesus told me to do it. Unsupervised teens online are nothing new. So when 16-year-old Emma Niederbrock started talking to a boy over the internet, no one suspected a thing. But this video is for Emma, because you just told me to say your name. So, I don't know. <laughs> but on the other side of the screen, Emma's new friend was hiding demons. I'm sorry, and uh, I had to do it. My mind just snaps, I couldn't control anymore. What started as innocent conversations spiraled into a nightmare, leaving four people murdered. Welcome to our channel. In today's episode, we'll explore how the lines between music and violence collided in the case of Emma Niederbrock and Richard McCroskey that shook the quiet town of Farmville. How did it all go so wrong? Let's start from the beginning. Emma Niederbrock was born in 1992 and grew up in a pretty typical church-going family. Her parents, Mark and Deborah, were the kind who believed in strong values and religious upbringing. They moved from Champaign, Illinois to Farmville, Virginia, when Emma was still young. As Emma got older, she started to feel like her parents were trying to push religion onto her. It wasn't something she felt connected to, and that disconnect grew over time. Like a lot of teenagers, Emma went through a rebellious phase. Her behavior at school became a big problem, and it wasn't long before her mom decided to pull her out of the public school system. From middle school through high school, Emma was homeschooled. Mark Niederbrock was the pastor at Walker's Presbyterian Church in Hicksburg, while Deborah, her mom, worked as a sociology and criminal justice professor at Longwood University. With parents so involved in faith and education, there were high expectations for Emma to follow a certain path. But Emma was starting to drift in a completely different direction. For those who remember, MySpace was huge back in 2007, long before Facebook became the go-to social media platform. Teenager Emma had a MySpace profile under the name Ragdoll, and it was there that she stumbled upon the world of horrorcore. It's not for everyone, but for an upset teen like Emma, it felt like a way to release her emotions. It wasn't much different from going through an emo or goth phase, just more extreme. Emma's new friends in the horrorcore community introduced her to more than just music. Soon she was experimenting with drugs and alcohol, things that her strict religious parents would have never approved of. As she dove deeper into this new lifestyle, Emma connected with other horrorcore fans on MySpace. She was all in, listening to the music and living the rebellious life. About six years after Mark and Deborah moved to Virginia, things took a tough turn. In 2009, Mark and Deborah divorced. Emma stayed with her mom in the family home, while Mark moved out. This change seemed to add to the growing distance between Emma and her parents. One day, while scrolling through MySpace, Emma stumbled upon the music of Razakel, a horrorcore rapper whose dark, edgy style resonated deeply with her. Emma became a massive fan, leaving comments full of admiration and praise on Razakel's page. To Emma's surprise, a few days later, Razakel responded. She couldn't believe it. Someone she looked up to was personally replying to her. What Emma didn't realize was that horrorcore, being a niche genre, meant artists were often very interactive with their fans on platforms like MySpace back in the day. Through these MySpace chats, Emma and Razakel formed a bond. They connected not only over their love of horrorcore, but also on a more personal level. Both of them enjoyed photography, makeup, and hairstyling. And as it turned out, they both had fathers who were Presbyterian ministers. This connection only deepened Emma's attachment to Razakel. Emma began expressing her newfound identity outwardly, including dyeing her hair pink. This only made her parents more worried. They decided it was time to intervene. 
So they took her to counseling, hoping it would help guide her out of the destructive path she seemed to be on. But by then, Emma was fully submerged in her new world. Razakel quickly realized Emma was new to the horrorcore scene and didn't have many friends in the community. Wanting to help, she introduced Emma to another fan from Virginia, who went by the MySpace handle Mrs. Free Abortion. Behind the bold username was an 18-year-old named Melanie Wells. When Emma and Melanie started talking online, they hit it off right away. They found they had a lot in common, despite the couple of years between them. Like Emma, Mel had also been homeschooled. She was the daughter of Thomas Wells and Kathleen Wells, and her family had moved from Louisville, Kentucky to Inwood, West Virginia, just before high school. Melanie dropped out of school and was studying for her high school equivalency diploma. From the moment they connected, Emma and Mel became inseparable. They bonded over their shared interests, and the more they talked, the closer they grew. With Razakel bringing them together and their mutual love for horrorcore, Emma now had a close friend who understood her in ways her parents never could. In September 2008, the weight of her parents' divorce was becoming more than Emma could handle. She was just 15, trying to make sense of the world, and that's when she met Richard McCroskey, an amateur rapper who went by the name Psycho Sam online. Richard was 19, much older than Emma, and although their connection raised some red flags, it gave Emma someone to talk to during a tough time. Richard became Emma's confidant. She opened up to him about the struggles at home, the divorce, and everything weighing on her. They bonded over horrorcore music and often kept an eye out for upcoming events in the scene. Turns out, even Richard knew Razakel. Richard became a source of support for Emma, especially when things with her parents were rocky. Richard McCroskey was from Hayward, California. His family, consisting of his parents and an older sister named Sarah, moved to Castro Valley in 2003, around the same time the Niederbrocks relocated to Farmville, Virginia. The McCroskey family wasn't particularly close, and Richard took it hard when his parents had problems of their own. He had trouble in school, too. Bullied for being overweight and having red hair, he became an easy target. Richard switched schools, moving from Tennyson High School to Hayward High. But the bullying never stopped, and eventually he dropped out of both. Richard's struggles didn't end when he left school. He was quiet and had a hard time standing up for himself. With few friends and little confidence, he found comfort in the internet. It became his escape, a place where he could be someone else, where he wasn't judged for how he looked or who he was. By 2008, Richard McCroskey was living at home and working as a freelance graphic designer. Around this time, he decided to try his hand at horrorcore rap. Under the stage name Psycho Sam, he uploaded his music to MySpace using a profile called Little Demon Dog. In the summer of 2009, Richard's parents separated, with his mother moving out of the house. This created an even stronger bond between Richard and Emma. Both had experienced the pain of their families breaking apart, and they leaned on each other for support. Emma, now 16, and Richard, 20, started talking almost every day, morning to night. Richard saw Emma as more than just a friend. He considered her his girlfriend. She would send him sweet, affectionate messages, promising to love him forever. But at 16, Emma's feelings were typical of teenage romance, which we all know can be fleeting. Even though they hadn't met in person, their connection grew through MySpace chats and photo exchanges. One day, Emma got up the courage to ask Richard to send her a video of himself. Normally, Richard was socially awkward and wouldn't do something like that, but this was Emma, someone he cared about. So he decided to make the video, even if it made him uncomfortable. All right, so you wanted a video and um, you made me videos, so... And he said, please, so I'll make you this video, even though I'm not gonna like do anything, because my room's kind of dirty and... Yeah, I don't want to show you my dirty room, but this video is for Emma, because you just told me to say your name, so, I don't know, <laughs> um, I'll make you another video once clean, I promise, unless you just want to, like, see my wall, because that's not dirty, but behind me is dirty, so, that's not good. Emma came across an event happening on September 12, 2009, an all-day horrorcore festival in Southgate, Michigan. It was a big deal for her because she and her best friend, Melanie Wells, loved going to these kinds of events together. 
even though Melanie lived about three and a half hours away in Inwood, West Virginia. The distance never stopped them from attending. When Emma told Richard about the festival, they thought it would be the perfect opportunity to finally meet in person. It was going to be their first ever in-person interaction, and for Emma, it felt like a date. But there was one catch. Emma's parents, they were understandably hesitant about their 16-year-old daughter meeting up with a 20-year-old man, especially since they'd never met him before. Since the divorce, Mark and Deborah had been trying to give Emma some breathing room, allowing her space to express herself and process everything. After some discussion, they came up with a compromise that felt safe for everyone. The plan was simple. Richard would first come stay with Emma and her mom, Deborah, so they could meet him in person. Once Deborah got to know him, both of Emma's parents, Mark and Deborah, would drive Emma, Melanie, and Richard to the festival in Southgate. While the three enjoyed the horrorcore event, Mark and Deborah would spend the day in the city, picking them up afterward and driving everyone back home. It seemed like a reasonable plan, a way for Emma to enjoy the festival and meet Richard in a controlled setting. In the days leading up to the event, Emma excitedly posted about it on MySpace. Next time you check your MySpace, you'll be at my house, she added. I love you so much, baby, forever and for always. A day before the concert, Richard had set out from California to Virginia, and Emma was filled with excitement. Her best friend, Melanie, had already come over on the 7th of September 2009 to stay with her until the big day. But when Richard finally arrived, it was a shock for Emma. He looked nothing like his MySpace photos. Richard appeared much skinnier in person, shorter too, with gelled back hair. His online persona had painted a different picture, a confident, edgy 20-year-old who oozed swagger. But the Richard who stepped off that plane was shy and timid, more like a nervous teenage boy than the bold daredevil Emma had come to know online. Emma's reaction was less than enthusiastic. She barely looked at Richard or spoke to him. She was clearly disappointed. This was not the exciting, cool guy Emma had imagined from their months of chatting. But with the concert plans already set, they all piled into the car on September 11th for the 10-hour drive to Southgate, Michigan. The car ride was awkward, to say the least. Emma tried to stay polite, but it was clear from her body language that she and Melanie were irritated by Richard. By the time they arrived at the festival on September 12th, the tension had only grown. Emma barely spoke to Richard and instead was busy flirting with other guys at the event and texting her male friends. Richard, visibly upset, found himself in an awkward position. He had traveled all this way, only to be ignored by the girl he thought was his girlfriend. The reality of their relationship wasn't living up to the fantasy they had created online, and it was clear things were starting to unravel. The festival wrapped up around 11 p.m., and they all drove home with Emma's parents. It had been a long day filled with mixed emotions. By the time they got back, everyone was exhausted. Just a couple of hours later, at 2.43 a.m. on September 14th, Melanie posted on her MySpace page, SFTW was amazing. Back in Virginia now. Be back in West Virginia on Wednesday. I miss everyone. That was the last anyone heard from her. After that post, Melanie went quiet. No online activity, no texts, no calls. Two days passed, and her parents, Thomas and Kathleen Wells, began to grow increasingly worried. Melanie wasn't answering her phone, and that was unusual for her. Thomas drove all the way from Inwood to Farmville, hoping to find her. But when he arrived, nobody was home. He rang the doorbell repeatedly and waited outside for about seven hours. When he returned home empty-handed, he was upset, not knowing where his daughter could be. Finally, four days after Melanie's silence, Kathleen decided to call the police on September 17th, Thursday. The officers arrived at the Niederbrock home for a welfare check. When they knocked on the door, it was Richard McCroskey who answered. He told the officers that Emma, Melanie, and Deborah had gone to the movies. Richard claimed he was Emma's boyfriend, and everything he had said seemed to check out. Call it incompetence or just bad luck, but the officers didn't dig deeper. They took Richard at his word and left, thinking everything was fine. Did well? Yeah. This is f***ing formal police department. Okay, did you just speak with somebody at the residence? Uh, yes, I just spoke with, I guess, the daughter's boyfriend. Okay, well, I don't know. It, I, my sergeant went over there, and he just said that it was a young kid, a boy, and that um, Melanie and the girl she's seeing with her at the movies now, yesterday they went to Richmond, vehicle had broken down, and the cell phone's dead, and that kind of thing, so... Is that what he's 
talk to you about? What he told me, yeah, and like I said, I but I don't know where the mother is. I don't know where. I mean, she's usually the one that I guess drives them around, and she's just disappeared. I I haven't spoken to her at all. The father I talked to earlier on today, right? He went. He said that he was going to. He was on his way. He was, as a matter of fact, he was on the road when I was talking to. Him. He was going through Farmville. He was supposed to stop at the house. I haven't heard from him since. Okay. Like I said, I I just I'm at this point. I don't know. I mean, I don't know what to think at all. Okay. You know, and, and him being at the movies, I just tried to call. He said that um, Emma tried to call or just called him from the movies, and I tried to call the phone. And um, he said she called from Sears Williams or right into it. Meanwhile, Kathleen spoke with Mark Niederbrock, relieved to learn that he had indeed dropped them off at Emma's house. Mark had moved to Pamplin, Virginia, only about 20 minutes away, and agreed to swing by the house. It was around 5 p.m. when Mark assured Kathleen he would call her back, but he never did. Unbeknownst to Kathleen, a woman walking by Emma's house that same day caught a whiff of something foul. She mentioned the smell to a friend, but they brushed it off and continued on their way. Was this an omen? On that same day, Richard left a peculiar message on his parents' answering machine, saying, I love you guys. It was odd and out of character for him. The next day, September 18th, Kathleen was frantic. She urged the police to return to the house. This is what doesn't make sense. I mean, my daughter would call. Right. Uh, so I just don't know what to think. I, I, I mean, I don't know what Scared me earlier. She was saying, "Oh, there's noise. There was noises in the basement coming from, you know, in the house." And, oh, I don't know. All right. If you don't hear anything from her, then just call us back, and we'll I'll send an officer back over there. Okay. At 3:20 p.m., they came back for another check. This time, they found the door unlocked, and nobody answered the doorbell. When they finally opened the door, they were met with a horrifying, overpowering stench the unmistakable smell of death. With probable cause, they entered the house to search for answers. They headed to Emma's bedroom on the ground floor, and there they found three dead bodies. In an upstairs room, they found another body. The victims were later identified as Emma, Mark Niederbrock, Deborah Kelly, and Melanie Wells. The cause of death? Blunt force trauma. The police described the scene as so horrifying they wouldn't elaborate on the details only confirming that all four victims had died from blunt force trauma. A manhunt for Richard McCroskey was soon declared, but Richard had already escaped and several hours earlier, around 4 a.m. on Friday, September 18th, his car had gotten stuck in a ditch at the end of a driveway on Poor House Road. A police car and a tow truck arrived to help him. During this interaction, Richard was ticketed for driving without a license. He claimed he was using his girlfriend's dad's car. Richard told the officers that he planned to fly back home to California on Saturday. The police officer even arranged for Richard to hitch a ride in the same tow truck. During the trip, the driver noticed red marks on Richard's neck that resembled hickeys. When the driver commented on them, Richard casually claimed that his girlfriend had given them to him. Inside the truck, the driver had to roll down the windows because Richard had a strong, unpleasant odor. He dropped him off at a gas station at 6 a.m., Once at the gas station, Richard called a cab to take him to Richmond International Airport. In a strange turn of events, the taxi was pulled over by a police officer for speeding. Remarkably unconcerned, Richard calmly exited the vehicle and lit a cigarette by the side of the road while the situation was sorted out. It was as if he had no worries at all. Even after two very close calls with the police, little did anyone know the true horror he had left in his wake. The search for Richard was now a race against time, with the authorities desperate to bring him in before he could disappear completely. But then, Razakel's boyfriend, Andres Shrim, called the police. Shrim reported that one of Richard's friends had spoken to him recently. This friend mentioned that Richard was noticeably upset and had made some disturbing comments, including that he had killed someone, maybe even a couple of people. With this information, the police were now certain that Richard was the perpetrator behind the murders. They circulated a photo of him in an attempt to track him down. What they didn't know was that Richard had left behind a piece of paper at the crime scene containing the exact address of the airport. His grand escape plan had been to wait at the airport for a flight in two days. At some point, Richard must have panicked. He attempted to buy a ticket from an earlier flight, but it was too expensive. 
With no other options, he had no choice but to wait. While sitting at Richmond International Airport, he was finally arrested. By Monday, the police had a warrant to search the McCroskey home in Castro Valley. They found phones and a computer belonging to Richard. As the pieces fell into place, the police started to decipher what had occurred and the true extent of Richard's actions. What happened was nothing short of a nightmare. Infuriated by Emma's indifference to his affection, Richard flew into a blind rage on September 15th. It started with Melanie, who was sleeping on the couch. She was the first to go, caught off guard and defenseless. Richard then moved on to Deborah, who was in her room, meeting the same tragic fate. Finally, he found Emma asleep in her downstairs bedroom. The absence of defensive wounds indicated that all three had died in their sleep. From 3 a.m. on Tuesday until 5 p.m. on Thursday, September 17th, Richard sat in the house with the de- bodies. Unknown to him, Mark had made plans to visit the house. When Mark arrived, Richard attacked him in a room downstairs. Richard then recorded a video confession. All right, so um, I'm making this video because or if anybody finds this, um, I really don't know what I'm trying to say. I'm, just, I'm breathtaking at what I've done. And I apologize. I know I'm gonna pay for my consequences. You know, I wish that I could have not done this, but I just lost my mind. I snapped and I did what I did, and I gotta pay for it now. My consequences. I'm like all shaky and stuff, but like, to anybody that finds this, tell my parents that like I love them and I'm very sorry for doing this. And uh, um, there's nothing really else to say to everybody that. It's probably going to hate me for this. I'm sorry. And uh, I had to do it. My mind just snaps. I couldn't control it anymore. His words were haunting, reflecting a mind teetering on the edge of sanity. On Friday, September 18th, around 3.45 a.m., Richard left the house. He stole Mark's car and took cash from his wallet. But he got the car stuck in a ditch nearby. After his arrest, Richard was anything but cooperative. We advised you that you were in the rights. You said you understood your rights and you signed the form saying you were willing to talk to us and you still willing to talk to us? Yes, but I would like to have somebody here too, like a lawyer. Okay, that, that, that is your option. So are you invoking your right to remain silent? Yes. Meanwhile, police began collecting evidence. They were determined to build a solid case against him. Richard McCroskey was charged with six counts of capital murder under Virginia law. The evidence against him was overwhelming. By September 20, 2010, it was clear that he would need to reach a plea deal to avoid the death penalty, and that's exactly what he did, waiving his rights to appeal. Richard was sentenced to four life sentences. He is currently serving his time at Wallens Ridge State Prison in Big Stone Gap, Virginia. In the end, this wasn't just about music or misunderstood teens. It was a horrifying collision of broken trust, unchecked darkness, and a tragedy that no one saw coming. How did you do it? Jesus told me to do it. Or does that suggest there's something still lurking beneath the surface? That wraps up today's episode. Don't forget to hit that subscribe button and turn on the notifications so you never miss an episode. If you or someone you know has had troubling online experiences, speak up and seek help. Stay safe, stay aware, and join us next time for another deep dive into the world of true crime.